Hey, hey, what's up guys? Kai here, and welcome back to Let's Play Valkyrie Profile 2, Silmeria. In our last episode, we started making our way through the underground royal path, we picked up some new party members, and we also came across an old pendant, which, thanks to Silmeria's object reading ability, gave us a bit of a glimpse into Alicia's childhood. I don't know how an inanimate object like that is able to store psychic energy, but hey, what do I know? I'm not the object reader. Today, let's continue onwards towards Japan. So one of you guys asked me recently if this game had any cutscenes that shows you how each of the Einherjar died, like in the first game, and the answer is no. And that's a bit of a heated topic for debate, because those cutscenes were one of the most distinguishing aspects to the first game. They were dark, tragic, and just flat out awesome. I think they were a great way to promote character development and to get the player to feel bad for and actually give a damn about these characters. So when I first played this game, I was a little disappointed to see them absent. Looking back though, from a story perspective, it's probably best that Tri-Ace went in that direction because in the first game at least, the plot was centered around a single main character, Leneth, who was the presiding Valkyrie of the time. And not only was it her mission to recruit Einherjar, but that was the sole objective for like the first half of the game. And in order to recruit them, she would have to be there when they die. So it, it would make sense that the player gets to see the events leading up to their death, right? Well, in this game, the plot is more focused on an entire cast of characters. And Einherjar not only have no relevance to the story, but they have no bearing on it either. So if we had all these cutscenes about these characters that don't really matter in a sense, I think it would get very distracting and they would feel not only out of place, but kind of like Tri-Ace was forcing them on us. And I can see how some people argue that because of that, the Einherjar just come off as generic pawns to only be used in battle, but I actually disagree. You know, even though there's no cutscenes, they each have their own backstory that you can read to learn about their pasts. And to be quite honest with you guys, some of the stories are just as heart-wrenching as the ones in the first game, if not more in some cases. I wish we could reverse the course of time. You know what? Screw it. Here, I'll, I'll show one to you guys. Let's use Mithra for an example here. Go, go to his status. Alright, the TLDR is that Mithra was the leader of the military of Frelgard, and he was behind the construction of hidden fortresses that were very important in keeping invaders out. However, one of his subordinates fucked up, and because of that, he was suspected to be um, treasonous. So during one battle, he was left to die on the battlefield, and he was captured by the enemy. Spent the next year in a dungeon being tortured However, he never spoke a word, and eventually his corpse was delivered back to Frailguard without eyes, ears, or tongue, and the king is said to have broken down in tears. That's pretty hardcore, if you ask me. <laughs> and if you are interested in some of these backgrounds for the Einherjar, let me know, and we can work something out so that I can showcase their backgrounds. Um, furthermore, though, Look when Mithra died. It was almost 800 years before Alicia was even born. Crad was around 300 years. Um, Rochelle was also between three to 400 years. So let's say we did have all these cutscenes for all these characters. They would just be really, really convoluted, and most of them would be about places or events that don't even matter nowadays. So I'm actually thankful that we don't have them you know, taking up time or space in the game. Yeah, you have to read about them, but you know what? Whatever. Back in my day, viewers, we had to read our cutscenes, and you know what? We liked it. <laughs> 
Here we get a Thunder Gem. Awesome. Can use that in battle as an item to deal some damage to an enemy. We can do it. Hey, hey, we got some more. Uh, what are those guys? Goblins, I think they're called. I think I called them gremlins last time by mistake. Yes. Also, you know what? Now that I think about it, another good reason why Ein Harriar kind of take a backseat in this game is because the presiding Valkyrie in this day and age is Hrist. So she's the only one that has any business being around all these people who are dying. Remember, Silmeria already has a bunch of Ein Harriar souls with her. It's a little gimmicky, in my opinion, but whatever, it works. Let's see if I can't break his weapon. We need to get some iron ores. I think we need two of those. Or is it three? I don't know, I'll probably farm it off screen. Ooh, luckily that missed. That fireball attack deals about 20 damage to your characters. And they only do that after you break their weapon. So you gotta watch out for that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I bet you are. Hey, hey, level up for Michelle. Nice. Yes. The stakes we play for is life itself. Tread care. All right, moving on. The path over to the left loops around back to the bridge, and there are no items over that way, so we're gonna go over here instead. We can do it! If you get a direct assault on those goblins when they're the enemy leader, you get a leather glove. So, that could be pretty nice. Went ahead and gave one of those to Krad. Oh hell. Here. Thought I could sneak under him, but I guess not. Alright. Yeah, we're gonna get hit by that. Ah, overkill. You have to try harder than that if you want to live. Hey, hey, we learned fortify physique. All right. Let's go ahead and equip that on her right away. It's fifty percent more defense. Not bad. And let's actually. That was the Earth Room. Oh, we have plenty of those. Okay. We're going to give that to... Not that these skills really matter, but I've got nothing else better to do, so why not? The stakes we play. And I don't mean the skills themselves are useless, it's just that I plan on releasing those Ein Harriar as soon as I can. So them having skills really doesn't make a difference to me. But why not, right? If you seek death, so yeah, we'll leave this one in I here. Shall help you. I think you can also get a blue darkness room from these goblins, but I wouldn't go out of my way to farm it. The thing about overkill viewers is that when you don't have it, you want it. <laughs> You'll be singing a different tune when you're really, really hurt. Besides, it's good to get as many items as you can. No glove, no love, so they say. What is left of your life now that you are dead? Probably not much would be my guess. <laughs> what kind of question is that? Anyways, let's see if anybody needs that. Oh yeah, he does. Let's 
give that to Crad. Hmm, there's a ledge up there, but I can't quite reach it. Whatever shall we do? Well... We're gonna bring this guy over here and use him as a platform. Haha! -ha. And over here we get a dwarf tincture. All right. Must we fight this battle? All right, guys. Took care of both of those battles. By the way, let me know what you think about me handling multiple battles off screen like that. Oh yeah, in that battle, I almost forgot. It's the little devil heart you can get from the goblins, and it's a blue strengthening rune. I don't know where I got the blue darkness rune from. That's not until the next dungeon. So. Again, not worth it. But it's there all the same. I'm gonna take care of both of these guys and be right back. I am no fighter, but I will Alright, after killing both of those guys, gotta level up for Crad and Rochelle. done. All right. Uh-oh. A safe point and a treasure box located next to each other? Gee, I wonder what's waiting for us right around the corner. Anyways, here we get the Sham Shear, a new weapon for Alicia. This weapon is pretty cool because notice the long sword at the bottom has two attacks. Well, her new weapon is a little bit stronger and it has three attacks. So now I'm going to go over the attack submenu for each of your characters because now we can have three attacks. And basically what this means is um, whenever you press the button that is assigned to your character the first time, they'll do their first attack. Press it again, their second attack, and then their third attack, finally. And you can set up your attacks in any way you want to, but it's very important to know not only where your attacks strike, but also if they have any added effects to them. Like Imperious Act here will knock the enemy up into the air, which is how I've been doing it this whole time. Crad can also launch enemies backwards with a knockback, and you can see stuff like this in the description of the attack. Like here it says hold the button to launch. And that just means you hold whatever button that character is assigned to. And you'll knock the enemy back. Um, this is also doubly important when you're trying to farm specific items from enemies. Because you need to know which body parts not only to target, but how to actually hit them. <laughs> and um, this really takes a lot of trial and error on your part because everybody has different playstyles, and there is no set path or set strategy that's the absolute best. Just go with whatever you feel like, you know, whatever you have fun with. Personally, I think Mirage Pierce is one of Alicia's best attacks in the game. Not only does it target the enemy in usually a critical area because it's a mid-range attack so you'll usually hit their torso or their head or something like that but it also ignores an enemy's defenses which is really nice it also seems to have a really high critical hit rate but maybe I'm just being paranoid now more on how enemies are affected by attacks if you knock them in the air and you hit them while they're airborne you'll see magic crystals, you know, just start appearing out of thin air. And that's really important because magic crystals not only give you more experience after battle, but later on you can use them as a form of currency as well. So knowing how to get more of those 
is going to be very important. And on the flip side, if you knock an enemy on the ground, or hit them when they're on the ground, that's what those purple gems are from. Um, and what those do is purple gems immediately restore a small amount of AP, allowing you to form longer combos, deal more damage, and that's really important because the higher your combo gauge, the higher the damage modifier is for your character's special attacks. So yeah, again, it just depends on your playstyle, but knowing these two aspects of combat is very advantageous. So knowing that, I actually want to change up Krad's attacks a little bit as well. And we'll give him Sweep Dive. Because that's going to be really important in just a few minutes here. Now mages, however, whoops, mages only get one attack. And the reason is because um, spells are usually very powerful or they hit multiple times. And um, yeah, as you can see here, he only has Frigid Damsel. Also, you'll notice that spells take a long time to actually activate in battle. You know, they kind of lock you in that animation. So that's why they only have one attack as well, just to kind of balance it out. If you could just sit there and spam your spells endlessly, <laughs> that would be a little bit ridiculous. But who am I kidding? We'll never get that ability. Nope. Sorry for that little mini tutorial there, guys, but uh, I didn't want to wait too much longer to talk about attacks. But uh, I am going to save... My no, I think we'll be okay, actually. There's the save point, actually. Whoops. I think the entrance is close. Great. There you go again with your visions. You watch your mouth. Don't you dare insult the princess like that. Your whining's insufferable. Hey, she asked me to come along. Swear allegiance to the princess or be on your way. Enough! I sense a guardian beast. I trust you two still have some fight left in you. Guardian beasts? So the king of Dapan keeps pet monsters? They're not the kings. These are souls who swore loyalty to Dapan, still bound to their country after death. They take the form of beasts to protect their land from invaders. I hope you're not too unnerved by this. I'd hate to think that I'd misjudged your caliber. Oh god, what the hell is that thing? Alright guys, it's boss time against the Ballistic Rhino. Yeah, now this boss music sounds like something out of a Star Ocean game. Alright, so this boss is actually very easy. As you can see, he is like covered in plate mail, so you don't want to attack from the sides or the front. But just like those beetles, if you attack from behind, you're going to be in pretty good shape. And there we go. <laughs> oh, I got a little lucky with that break Seems mode there. But that's essentially what you want to do. Go for the tail to expose his weakness and just attack from behind. If you don't kill him in that first round, you can then walk around that pillar and then he'll spin to try to follow you, but he won't be able to hit you. 
And then once you get around to the opposite side of the pillar, you're free to once again dash behind him and resume the assault. But, all right, that was easy enough. <laughs> so one of the really cool things about this game is that after you defeat a boss, you have the option to fight them again. And I'm going to be doing this a few times off screen just because I want to farm a few items from the different parts of his body. And I'm going to take care of that off screen in between episodes. But when we come back next time, we are going to enter the pan and see just what kind of welcoming committee we have waiting for us. But until then, as always, guys, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good day. See you next time.